Um, so you're all in here for reactor design. I'm Kevin Dunn, and um, I'm going to just spend the first uh, class this evening going through what this material is about in reactor design. It's purely a overview class. If you haven't got the slides down yet, I will print it out for you. Um, they are available on the website. I'll talk a bit about that in a minute. Um, but tonight, you don't need slides. Tonight, what I need you to do is just to pay attention to what's up here. We're going through a bit about what this course is about and all the administrative details about how we will run for the next 12 or 13 weeks. Um, and of course, any questions at any time, just uh, raise your hand. So, so um, a bit of background first, then some admin issues, and then discussing what the course is, is all about. Let me start just a bit and introduce myself. Um, so I came to MAC in 2000 from South Africa, the University of Cape Town is where I graduated from. Uh, Dr. Christian Watts was actually my, uh, my professor there at Cape Town and then he immigrated to Canada and I came along. I uh, did my master's degree here and finished that up in 2002. And uh, that's the extent of my education. So I'm not a doctor, I'm not a doctor, I'm just a kid's call me Kevin. Um, by my first name, I prefer that, or if you don't want to call me by my first name, you can call me Prof or Sir or whatever you like, but um, not a doctor, so don't call me that. Um, since graduating then, I finished uh, that in 2002. I worked with John McGregor, who was a professor here at Mac, and we started a company up together with one of his students. I worked on that for a few years, consulting and data analysis projects. Uh, which is my background then, statistics and data analysis, and I still do that uh, to some extent. Uh, my most recent employment was with GlaxoSmithKline here in Mississauga for a one-year contract. That finished up in June, and then the university asked me to kind of teach full-time in July uh, this last year. So prior to that, I've taught a number of courses here part-time at MAC, uh, but I've been here full-time since, since last year. And taught last semester was separation processes and then uh, the problem solving economics courses, so 4N and 4N. This term I'm teaching 3K and 4C. So if you want to speak with me or get a hold of me in any way, my office is in BSB. Uh, they don't have space for me in JAG, they've run out of rooms there. So BSB in the basement, B105. Anytime on those days, Monday, uh, Monday, Tuesday, I'm typically working on other things and have other classes that I'm preparing for. I'm taking the courses myself, so I'm not around. But Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday are the best times to, to reach you. Um, you can arrange a meeting. The best way is by email. So kevin.dunn at mac.ca. Or uh, you can uh, use my cell phone to phone me. Uh, don't use that extent, my Mac master phone number. I barely answer that phone. So, um, so those are the best ways to get hold of me, preferably by email. So let me just uh, talk about the class. The uh, material we're covering is traditionally taught by Dr. Mashkar, who's on sabbatical this year. So I'm filling in for him just for the single year for the 3K, and then he'll go back to teaching here at Dr. Uh, so you guys have got me for this, for this year round. Uh, the slides we'll use on most three years, we'll start to use them in the next class and onwards, and I'll make some small modifications to his slides, but for the most part, what you're going to be seeing is his work. Um, however, the material tonight is my, my, my slides. So before I get, go any further, I would like to introduce the TAs so that they can go back to their offices and continue doing their research stuff and whatever they do in the evenings. Uh, so we have two great TAs uh, this year. Uh, the first one, uh, Vida. Um, Vida is working with Dr. Tom Adams, and she's studying her PhD. Her office is there in JHE uh, 141A, and uh, her extension number. And then the second TA is Dominic. Uh, Dominic is also with uh, Tom Adams, so we're both of his uh, two of his students here. Uh, Dominic has, has just started on his master's, and he's available uh, to talk with in the penthouse, JHE 370, or extension to the Okay, so uh, call him uh, by those phone numbers, or preferably set up an appointment by email. So just to quickly talk about office hours for this case, we thought of having office hours in previous courses, they just don't work. No one comes and shows up to them, or they don't work for you. You've got other classes at the time that there's office hours. So we're trying out this system where if you need to speak with the TA, email them. They will pick a time when they can meet with you, and there may be one or two emails backwards and forwards between both of you to, to sort that time out. 
and then you can meet with them at, at that point of time. Uh, rather than having designated office hours. We'll see how that goes for a while. If it gets out of hand, we may go back to regular office hours and try to find some time that works best for everyone. Okay, so that's that's the general approach. Do you guys want to add anything? No? They'll, they'll be with you in the tutorials. I'll be in the tutorials as well. Um, and uh, they'll be available to help you anytime. Okay, so we're going to have got two great teams. Thanks. Uh, the other thing about my courses is I always videotape them where possible. So at the back of the class is a camera that's recording the course, the classes. And uh, these videos are then uploaded to my website at, at um, usually about a day or two after the class is finished. Now I get tremendous feedback about the videos in my other courses. The students like them. They help you prepare for assignments. They help you prepare for tests and exams. I get the most hits on that web server the day before their exam, it just goes like crazy. But they're all like downloading and watching the video. And that's exactly what it's intended for. If you're using the video to skip class, that's okay. I don't need to see you in class. <laughs> um, I would prefer it if you were in class because there is quite a lot that you get from the class that may not be captured quite easily in the video. For one, this class is extremely white with the white roof and the white board and the white projector in the front. So the, screen, the, the fine details get washed out. They don't come out very clearly on the video. Sound, not always the best. There's people walking up and down in the passages outside and that uh, microphone is incredibly sensitive. So it picks up a lot of extraneous noise. So not the best quality. Definitely being in the class, you get a better experience. But my opinion is you're either eating in or you're taking out. Your choice. You come into the class or you're watching it at home after hours. But the best reason for having the video is the following. You come to class, you've seen something but you didn't quite get it the first time, and you might need to pause and rewind and stop and start and see it the second and the third time before you get it. Um, I had the experience in grad school where I took a course uh, two years back to back, and I really only got the material the second time. I understood the material the second time. I don't want you to come and have to take 3K4 again a second time. Okay, I'd rather you watch it as many times as you needed to understand the material, or email me and set up an appointment to make sure you understand what's going on. But this at least gives you one, one way in which uh, you can recap what's covered in the class. There's also an audio recording up at the front um, if you prefer just to listen to the, to the audio itself. So both of the audio and the video will be posted to the website. Now, the website is the main component to this course in terms of communication and in terms of materials. So it's learnchemacmasterca slash 3 k 4 Everything related to the course will be posted there. All the slides, all the tutorials, assignment questions, the midterm uh, material, instructions for the midterm and the final exam. All my communication with you is via the website. I will not send you an email. Almost never will I be sending emails to the class. And, uh, all the years I've taught at Mac, I've never sent a mass email to the class. I only communicate via the website. So my expectation is, that you're checking that website three to five times a week, um, pretty much every day. Or if you want uh, notifications pushed to you, you can subscribe to the Twitter feed to the website, and any not, any announcements I make via the website get, get pushed to you there. So it's whatever choice uh, you prefer. So uh, let me just uh, show you that quick. The website is learnchemacmaster.ca. Oh, yeah. Um, okay, so there's my uh, kind of preloaded it. So that's what the website looks like. When I'm talking about announcements, they appear in this corner over here. So there's the, the first four announcements already for the course. All the course materials will be posted up here on the top right hand side. So the course outline and the slides you're looking at right now, they're available at that first link. The class on Wednesday will start with more balances. You'll be able to go to that link. It's red right now, indicating there's no material there. But by uh, tomorrow or so, there will be material that you can go to that link and download the PDFs of the slides ahead of time. You're responsible then for printing it out and bringing it to class. 
There's a few suggested course readings over there. Um, these are extra textbooks that you might want to look at material beyond what the official textbook is. I have a few suggestions listed there. Here's where the assignments and tutorials will be posted. Right now I just have links for assignments, but there will be links for tutorials coming soon. The course project, the written midterm, and the final exam. And then the calendar for the course is here on the bottom on the left. So this shows you right now where the class is. We're at 5.30 here. The next class is on Wednesday. The next one's Thursday. There's no tutorials this week. Next week, there will be tutorials, one in the morning at 11.30, one at 8.30. Assignment one is going to be due on the 16th. Okay, so you've got all the material, uh, all the deadlines and dates set up there in the calendar on the course website. Any questions on that so far? On, the, on those administrative details? So, through K4, that's the key website. Uh, it's a LinkedIn from the McMaster Cambridge website, or um, you can just bookmark it right now. We'll be checking that frequently. Yes. Uh, I took a look at the course online, and somewhere along said, um, if you get below 50, yeah, we'll talk about that in a minute. We'll talk about grading in a few minutes, yeah. So let's talk about the textbook first. Uh, there's two textbooks that can be purchased. You may pick either one. So the first one that's shown up there is this one with the uh, picture or the photograph on it. This is the newer version, 2011. It's got a very different type. Of, it's Essentials of Chemical Reaction Engineering. And it's the first edition. Really what it is, is essentially, it's the fifth edition of this book, which is the fourth edition. So this is the fourth edition called Elements of Chemical Reaction Engineering. So Fogler substantially revised this book, and it became this. But they called it a new name, and so it gets the first edition. So I will refer to this one as F2006, the publication year by Fogler, and this one with the photo F2011. The bookstore on campus has this one for sale because they purchased the out-of-date ones. What they were set up in their computer from last year, they just kept recycling it. This one, if you want to purchase it, you have to look through on Amazon or Chapters or some other uh, source that you normally get your textbooks from. Both are equivalent. I will always give references to both. Chapters 1 through 5 are about the same in both books, which is about the first two months of this course. Then after that, the chapter numbers differ, but the material is available in either book. There's only one small section that we'll cover in the course that is not in the new book. Interestingly enough, he decided to cancel a chapter from the old book, and so it's not available in the new book, but that's one week of material right at the end of the course, and I will give you some supplementary material for that if you purchase the newer book. So feel free to purchase whichever one is cheaper or most convenient for you. Um, and in the course outline, I give a bit more guidance. The newer book has some more safety and bioreactors and solar energy. Um, the older book obviously wouldn't have that yet. So if you're the type of person who likes to keep your textbooks after you graduate, by all means go for the newer one. If you're just the person who resells your book and uh, gets rid of it at the end, then it doesn't really matter whichever one you pick. Any, any questions on the textbook? Any doubts on that? I'm not sure what their costs are, unfortunately. Um, I normally try to not have prescribed textbooks for my courses, but this one is a course that really requires a prescribed book. So you may have to spend a bit of money. I'm sorry. <laughs> the um, feedback to me at any time is via this website. So if you go to learnchemaster.ca slash feedback questions, this is uh, LearnCHE, by the way, is my personal site here at the university. I've got there's several links about over there, but the last link over here is feedback questions. Here is a web form that you can send any feedback at any time about the course. Any questions, any comments, any criticism, any suggestions for improvement. This form is anonymous. You don't have to fill in your email address down here. If you don't fill in your email address and you send it, I will receive your message. I will not be able to respond back to you. So it's used, uh, last term it was used about 120 times, 
in between my two courses, people were making comments on like, I can't see the orange marker from the back of the class, so I stopped using orange. Or the lights are too bright and I can't see the screen very clearly. Things like that. Or more substantially, I, me and several of my friends really didn't understand how you explained concept X. And then I can redo that better in the next class. Okay, so feel free to use this at any time. However, I do prefer you to email me from your regular Mac email, but if you feel that the information you want to tell me is sensitive or you don't want, uh, like if it's a comment or criticism that you think I may think negative about you because of it, I'd rather still hear what you have to say, but this way you don't have to reveal your identity. So uh, feel free to use that in any way you, you uh, prefer. Regarding software for this course, um, there is some software use later on in the course project and for the more advanced assignments. So as the course progresses, we'll get to a point where you cannot solve integrals analytically by hand anymore. You will be expected to do that in the first few weeks of the course and in the final exam. But certain assignments, those integrals and, and equations will be too difficult to integrate analytically. You'll have to resort to computer software for that. So Python or MATLAB are two languages I know very well and you're welcome to use them or any other language you prefer. If you're looking for symbolic processing, uh, the R language has got some symbolic processing capability. You may have used it for statistics in the past, but it does work very well for symbolic processing as well. Or uh, the integral websites on, online uh, can do that for you. Polymath, the MATLAB, and all the, all the good work you did with Dr. Adams in 3E for an in integration, uh, writing your own code E integrator, that's going to be used again for your final course project. That's the reason why 3D4 is taught before 3K, is so that you get to use that material in 3K here. Um, so, so you're going to have to get, get up to speed with that. In terms of the analytical integration and, and differentiation, that's why 2ZZ is, is, a, is a mandatory requirement for this course. Okay? So all those concepts, those math concepts, you must be up to speed with. Uh, one way you can see 3K4 is simply as an applied math course. We're simply applying those mathematical concepts of differentiation, integration to ChemEng processes. That's a naive way of seeing it, but it is one interpretation of problems. Yeah. Will there be a lot of help with the programming aspects of the course? Because some of us still haven't done those courses. Okay, so there will be some, um, certainly with Polymath and, and MATLAB. I will be giving example scripts on the course website and then you can use that to learn from. But it is self-study, so I will give you detailed scripts that show you how to integrate something and how to set it up in the software, but you're going to have to invest the time on after the class to do it. Um, and we may cover some of it in tutorial time as well. There's time there. But yes, you're not in the world, for sure. Anything else on, on the software? So, Outside class, I, as I said um, earlier, the TAs and I will answer your emails promptly. Uh, if you have questions about the material, the first people to talk with are the TAs. That's, that's their function is to assist you with learning. Um, and they have my full support. They're feeding back. I meet with them weekly to update and find which concepts are, are, uh, you're struggling with. I do not have last majority of time to meet with everyone in the class. Okay, so the people who you will have more frequent access to are the TAs. Um, my Monday and Tuesdays, for example, are entirely blocked off with teaching and other courses. Uh, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, I'm, I'm less busy. So those are the three blocks of time I have. But certainly, you're going to have easier access to the TAs. CC me, though, on any emails to them. And I, that way, I also know what's, what's, uh, what you're struggling with. Um, there's a tendency for people to use Gmail and Hotmail and other addresses. That's fine. Um, we do prefer you to use your Mac emails for the primary reason that we filter our emails. Myself and the TAs, if your email comes from macmaster.ca, it gets filtered and placed in a high priority folder, where, which I deal with right away. If you're sending from Gmail, it gets, it gets no filtering and I deal with it in the order that I deal with my friends and family. So MacMaster gets higher priority because they pay me. My friends and family don't. So, um, so that's, that's, that's the reason for MacMaster addresses. And uh, then, so email to figure out concepts and then set up an in-person meeting. Okay, so now let's, let's take a look at a bit why 
you should be studying this course. Apart from the fact that it's a prerequisite that you need to finish chemistry, there's, there's, there's some other interesting reasons here. The first is reactors in a chemical process are, if you had to build a new chemical process, you would be spending about 15 to 25 percent of your money on reactors. About 5% or so you'd be spending on mixing equipment and storage tanks and so forth. And then the rest of your money you'd be spending on separation processes. So distillation columns, membranes, vapor liquid equilibrium, separation processes and so forth. Uh, so that's what you learn about in 3M. And 4M, uh, which is the separations elective I teach in the fourth year and in 3K here in this year. So we're learning in this course how to convert material and then in future courses, you'll learn how to separate material out and, and, and um, improve the concentration or the purity of your products. These two are unique chemical engineering courses. Nowhere else do we learn about conversion, conversion of materials in the reactor, and then separation. All the other courses you take in your undergraduates, they're taken by other engineers as well. So numerical methods, simulation modeling, all these courses listed here, thermo, fluid flow, and heat transfer, mechanical engineers take all, all those courses as well. Stats taken by civil, chemistry, mechanical engineering, all the engineers take the stats course at some point. Process control, electrical engineering, bioprocessing is taken by bioscience students, polymers and problem solving. Those are taught in all the other courses and other, other faculties. But reactor design, separation processes, those are two unique chemistry courses. So, so that's why we have you come, go through the, the screen for 3K and the 4N. But that's not a good enough reason to, to want to study this material. Um, what is, is the following. Recognize that we have reactors all around us. Your entire body is a bioreactor. Um, specifically, your, the part from your stomach down through your intestinal tract track is a very key part of how your body generates energy from the food we eat. Uh, we also use it for alcohol and other substances, but that all, every time we put material into our body, raw materials of some sort, they are getting converted to new materials and energy and then, um, and then wasted out, so broken down. So our whole system there is a bioreactor. And while we won't study that in this course, it is applicable. All the topics that we learn about are used. If you're going into pharmaceuticals and pharmacokinetics, they model the body as a first order CSTR. So the equations we will learn in this course are applicable outside of ChemEng in a number of other contexts. Another one is cellular pathways and cellular mechanisms. Right down to the cellular mechanism is essentially a complex bioreactor. So again, bio people will model those cellular pathways and cellular reactions as the same way we would model in this course. There's obviously this fundamental uh, photosynthesis reaction that takes place that uh, uh, purifies uh, the air for us, generating oxygen and, and generates energy for, the, for plants and trees and, and other living organisms like that. Animals, same as people, they're bioreactors as well. So my, my purpose of illustrating the slide here is to point out that it's not just the oil and gas industry and polymer industry that you'll be using this material in. When we think of chemical reaction engineering, those are the standard topics that come up. These books are filled with never-ending examples of CO2 and methane and acidic anhydride and all sorts of typical oil and gas reactions. But um, don't be constrained by that. If you're working in wastewater treatment or metals and minerals, I'll show a few pictures in the, in the, in the next few slides. Foods and beverages. Um, all of those are manufactured in a, in a bioreactor or in a reaction system. So fermentation of, of alcohol to create beer, or fermentation of foods um, of, to create other byproducts. These are very important reaction systems that we, you could deal with once you graduate. It's not just oil and gas, and it's not just polymers that, uh, that require the use of, bio, of, the of uh, reaction engineering. And very interestingly here, the last ad application was one I learned about in, in GSK, and some of you may be aware of it. Um, many of the new drugs are being produced inside cells these days. So 
drugs are now not just produced synthetically on benchtop, but in bioreactors where they're a byproduct of a cellular process. Those cells that are broken, harvested, and the important uh, or the important item that's from a cell is then harvested and then generates a very valuable biopharmaceutical product. So in very small quantities, these drug companies are producing product that's incredibly valuable. And these new drugs are then used to treat uh, diseases and conditions that were incredibly hard to treat in the past when to treat the So many of these new drugs are being developed using cellular processes and they're taking place in bioreactors on the small scale. So don't just think of large chemical reactors when you think of this on this topic of schools. So chemistry really comes down to it is about processing the Wanted a broad definition of chemistry, that is one of the we're processing material, and we have the processing material and converting it in some form of reaction system. Whether there's an actual reaction taking place, there is a conversion of material from one state to another. And we can model that as a reaction, and then the topics from reaction engineering are going to be. So when you look at a chemical process though, these chemical reactors are very unimpressive. They're metal units that, that don't look like it. If you're driving past uh, QW and you're looking at the Petro-Canada's refinery that, that used to be close to the city of Montreal and other, other petrochemical refineries in Australia, you're seeing impressive units like distillation blocks and large towers. But the reactors, they look like nothing. They're tiny in many cases and really not impressive. But the whole point is profitability and economics depend on that. So if that reactor is not designed for it, for not getting the conversion that you require, that entire system is going to be unprofitable. We're going to lose money and but we are the final system. So if you talk with any of the people that do react to design, I've, I've, I've met with one company recently, they spent several years designing the reactor. It's not something that happens in months. They, there's a lot of complexity related to it. Unfortunately, we don't get into that complexity in this course. This course is called Introduction to Reactor Design. So we really do look only at the basics, but recognize that optimizing that design to make it really profitable for the company is something that is really intensive. So these are all good reasons to study reactants. Um, at the end, what you get from it really is what's shown over here is a, a reactor on a flatbed truck. It's about five meters in diameter and 25 meters long. We can see three compartments <coughs> to that reactor. So there's three major sections of the reactor, the left, the middle, and the right over here. And I will show you what the internal of the reactor looks like. So this is um, a photo from The first thing is, is, this is probably the most useful reason to study the situation, which most of you will face. We're looking for a company at their existing site, so we're not designing a new reactor. So reactor design is not always about new, new reactors. We're looking at an existing company with an existing reactor that's been going for several years and been producing product uh, quite profitably. Now the recession hits, say back in 2007 to 2009, many companies had to downsize their production. The demand for their product drops off, they need to scale back. Do you operate at a lower flow rate? And at, if so, at what lower flow rate do you operate? Will the reaction still go to completion? to the required conversion that you need to get the purity of the final product that you require. What can you do to still operate, but operate at a lower throughput? So you've got an existing unit, but now operating under different conditions. We need to still use the same design equations to design a new reactor, 
but now we're designing it with a constraint. Our constraint is we have to use this existing piece of equipment, but move to a different operating point. So what is that operating point? To achieve a lower production throughput, but still at the same level of quality that, you, that your customers expect from you. The customers that haven't left you. So you'll still have a few customers requiring your product or at lower demand, how do you still meet their needs without producing at the same level you did earlier? Or conversely, demand goes back up, greater than the level the reactor was initially designed for. So companies will design the units based on a forecast of what they expect the market's demand to be. However, in many cases, their forecast is incorrect. Here, the forecast is for lower requirements. Here, we need more. We don't have time to design a new reactor, install it, commission it, set it up, qualify and test it. Those take years, two or three years approximately for a typical reactor design from beginning to final commissioning and installation, okay, based on my experience with, um, with my dad. So I'll talk about that in a minute, but you can't do this quickly. You have to react to the market quickly. When the demands go up, your customers want that new product right away. How do you achieve that? you go at higher flow rates? Do you go at higher temperatures? Are you going to get additional side reactions? Do you change to different catalysts? What is going to happen to your catalyst when you operate at higher temperatures? Can you still get that same conversion within the existing reactor? Okay, so these are a number of questions that you'll be having as an engineer. And because reactor design is only taught in chemical engineering, you can't rely on your mechanical engineering colleague to sort this out for you. Okay. This is something you have to figure out and understand. Well, here's an example. I worked with a company north of Toronto a few years ago. You've got a competitor now who's come up and able to produce the same product as you. They're using a different technology. They're making the same product. They may be in a different country, so they're able to produce it cheaper. And they're busy taking your market share away from you every month they're busy eroding your market share. How can you produce that the same product at the quality that your customers still expect, but at a lower cost? Do you operate at lower temperature? That will reduce cost. But what's going to be the side effect of operating at a lower temperature? What can you do to increase conversion? So having a low conversion is wasteful. It results in increased recycle, or waste of, uh, of byproduct that you can't sell, or byproduct that you have to sell at a lower cost, at a lower price. So how can you get to that same level that your competitor is, or better, and still beat them? Can you reduce the impurities in your product, in the outlet from your reactor? Okay, so here's an example of the company I was working with. Their competitor was producing product here in this region. This uh, plot shows the quality of the product being produced by their competitor. Their competitor is producing a very consistent product day in and day out. So every sample there is taken a few weeks apart. This company goes and purchases their competitor's product every few weeks and does tests on it and see how the competitor uh, performs relative to them. The purple dots are the company I was working with. Their product is all over the map. Some days it has impurities, other days it's very good. How can this company make their process operate and behave the same way as the competitors. That's something I, I look at in the graduate course I teach and foresee the statistics course I teach because this is all related to data. But my point of showing this to you in 3K is to show so you can see, look ahead, what's, what you could be doing with your with, as a chemical engineer. You're operating over here and producing product over here. You want to produce product that's like your competitors with less variability. What do you do in your process to get to that level of So those three reasons are typical ways you will use reactor design. Less than 1% of you will actually design new reactors. So reactor design is not new reactor design. Reactor design, the reason why you teach it is so that you learn how existing units operate, how you can improve them and optimize them. Okay, so what you, what you typically have to do is you have to decide, do I use a batch reactor, a plug flow reactor, or a tank, or a packed bed? These are options if you're designing a new reactor. 
do you operate that reactor isothermal, isothermally, adiabatically, or do you use some form of hybrid approach, maybe a two-step system? If you choose to operate adiabatically, what is the temperature profile going to be in that reactor over time? Or if you're operating isothermally, what, at what temperature do you operate that unit? What are the compositions and flow rates that you pick? Um, what phases are present? If you've got a catalyst, there's going to be a solid phase, but are you going to have liquid and are you going to have vapor phases present? How are you going to mix them to make sure there's good contact between your reactants so that you can produce your product? So these are the decisions you make, and every time you make one of these decisions, you solve some of these issues over here on the right. By setting up those decisions, you can size the reactor. So that picture I showed you, the reactor was, was 25 meters long by 5 meters in diameter. There's a reason for those dimensions. They were found based on these earlier decisions over here on the left. What is the composition of the products leaving? We're going to build mathematical models that can predict those compositions for us. What are the temperatures in the reactor? Again, mathematical models. The applied math and the 2ZZ material I was referring to, we're going to use all of that to estimate those exiting temperatures, those exiting compositions, and the exiting of oh, the pressure in that reactor. And then the pressure drop. If it's a packed bed reactor, we want to estimate that because we need to know how big pumps do we need so that we can get that pressure drop across the packed bed reactor and push our material through the packed bed. Okay, so these are all outcomes from all the problems we're going to be solving in the course. These are the outputs or the answers we're going to want to get to from, from the reactor as well. Okay, what we won't be studying is, as I said, the design of the reactor. We'll estimate the volume of the reactor, but we're not going to learn how to configure and place these flanges over here and over here. What motor do we pick? What's the impeller speed that we use? and so on. These are technical details that we look at after we've designed the reactor. Uh, but it's not something we cover here in the intro to reactor design of course. So these, uh, so these next few pictures I emailed my dad this morning and he sent me a whole lot of diagrams and, and photos. So I've shown a few over here. We're not going to be, be studying that. We're not going to be just studying how do we uh, design that impeller. So there's a number of correlations with one can use is how many blades, what shape of blades should there be, what speed do we rotate those blades at to get optimal mixing. All of those issues, not something we're going to cover in this course. Um, <clears throat> we're not going to study materials of construction. So here's a, here's a reaction a reactor uh, that's lined with brick. It's lined with brick because there's a strong acidic environment inside this reaction uh, vessel with minerals and metals and water and gases taking place. And brick lining is one of the most effective ways to guard and safeguard the outer shell, the metal shell. So we line it with brick first. We're not going to be looking at those reasons for doing that. Okay, so this is a photo my dad sent me on a reactor in Zambia that he, he, he designed and, uh, and set up a few years ago. Um, Here's another one, an autoclave. So an autoclave here is a multi-component reactor. Remember the one I showed you on the flatbed that had three, three sections? Here's one with four sections. So material enters in the first two, well mixed, but there's these dividing walls and the material flows from one section to the next and then leaves at the end over there. So every, se every successive compartment, uh, you get different concentrations, different temperatures, we get a profile developing through that reactor. Here's a view through that long, that long bed. You will almost never get to see one of these in real life. I'll show you why in a minute. But access to the internals of these is almost only seen when the reactor is going to be set up and then never again. Once this reaction, reactor vessel is closed up, you'll never get inside it. So here's a nice photo that shows these different compartments. And there's a bit of depth in there. There's a ladder in the final compartment all the way at the end. This is how the person got in and out of this vessel. So here's, here's why you won't get in. Because you see that opening at the top over here. That port is then used. The motor is lowered down. And this is the drive shaft of the motor. And you look at all those nuts and bolts on that flange over there. They don't open these things up. Once they're set up, that's it. Okay, so that drive shaft is about my height, maybe a bit, a bit taller than me. We're not going to look at the design of that. Here's some sensors, some oxygen probes and pH probes that are added into the vessel. 
we don't look at those details. The externals and the internals, we don't really cover in this course. Um, here's a, another one showing you the tremendous amount of ancillary piping that has to go with this tiny reactor over here. There's oxygen uh, supply over there and pipes, pressure probes, temperature probes, pH probes, all of those go into the vessel. Those are used for monitoring and controlling the unit afterwards. And we'll learn a bit about those in 4N, how to, how to um, estimate the needs for some of those and why we have those units. Okay. Here's another one, a company that I work with. Uh, <coughs> very, very clean, very shiny. This is used to produce a uh, product in the environment which is incredibly sterile. Um, there's interesting systems inside this reactor to clean it out. So clean in place systems. So very, very um, abrasive chemical environment that's used to clean this reactor between uses to make sure that there's no arterial contamination and growth in that system. Uh, there's a number of scrapers to make sure the walls are scraped down. And here, the impellers that you normally see are solid, these impellers have holes in them. Okay, so the design of these impellers are very specific for the type of material being processed in that unit. The reactor on the right hand side, here we see cooling coils on the outside. So it's essentially got a heat exchange mechanism to keep the material in the reaction vessel at a certain temperature and to adjust the temperature profile over time. Again, we don't look at how those are designed, but this is something that you can do based on your heat transfer process. And so once we know the temperature requirements for the vessel, it's a matter of estimating the heat transfer coefficients in that cooling coil and then calculating the rate of heat transfer that takes place. So it is possible to do uh, some of these calculations, but that's not the focus of 3K. And then finally, this is a very rare photo that my dad, uh, my dad took when they commissioned the new reactor. Before closing up the lid, they put material in here and they took a photo. It shows how one of those autoclaves mixes the liquid. So you never see this in practice because these vessels are entirely closed, but they left one port open, stuck a camera down there, took the photo, and then closed it up finally. Um, so here we see this impeller, the motor up here, mixing this fluid inside the circular reactor. There's an injection port and probes over there coming in. And we, we model this in this course. We'll model it as a CSTR. But there's a number of assumptions that a CSTR is being well mixed. There's clearly going to be regions in this reaction vessel which are not as well mixed as the, as the majority. There's going to be dead spots and so forth in that reaction vessel that we need to take into account. Okay, so here gives you a nice view of what takes place in a CSTR. But we have to recognize that the CSTR idea is only an ideal concept. It doesn't actually exist in practice. OK, so that's a bit of a rundown of what the course is and what it's not. Um, just in terms of structure, there's eight, eight sections to the course. They correspond to different chapters in the textbook. I will introduce each chapter as we get to them, so I won't talk about that in this evening's class. But we will start with mole balances on Wednesday's class. So that's a recap of some very basic chemistry and, um, and it should be a straightforward section. And then we'll get on to the very interesting section where we already start to design and size the reactor in, in the second chapter. Any questions on, on that coverage before I talk about the grading and, and some of the last few details? We're all excited to get started with the reactor. Sure, because it's, it is an important topic. Um, we're going to have a lot of fun getting into the details of this over the next 12, 13 weeks. So let's just talk a bit about um, grading and such. Uh, just one thing on timing. The time for this class is set from 5.30 to 6.30. So in general, I will start at 5.30. However, the, I set up the video cameras and stuff takes me a few minutes. So maybe I'll start at 5.35 and still run till 6.30. So the classes will tend to be about 45 to 50, maybe 55 minutes on um, <coughs> if, if we've got questions and, and need to make the time. So, so just to uh, get through. Okay, the timetable is, is 6.30 that I have. Yeah. 
or maybe it's, uh, I'll, I'll work around it, we'll, we'll see how it goes, yeah. So let's talk a bit about grading. Um, grading in my courses is based on the following criteria in order of importance. The first is that you understand and demonstrate that you understand the concepts. And I'm pretty, pretty strong on that, the idea of conceptual understanding of the material. Um, and very key is the ability that you demonstrate the ability in those questions that you can apply the concepts to new ideas or new situations when different situations that we haven't learned about in this course. So this is going to be very unusual and is going to annoy you at first because you will be penalized in the science of exams because you're not able to take the material I presented in class and apply it to a new situation that's similar but different. Because you've not seen an example like this in the textbook, you're going to say, why the hell is he asking us to apply it to a situation you've not learned about? In third year, and definitely in fourth year, we're working our way up to developing a skill where you can apply the material and concepts we learn to new situations. It's an important skill we need, and by the fourth year course, especially in 4M, and in 4M, you have to have this ability to apply the concept to new instances that we've not taught before in class. Okay, so you will see some of that in the assignments. You need to think creatively about the problem, okay, how to solve it. And my questions are almost never plug and play, plug and chug. Okay, so you're used to that from your math, you're used to that from statistics, you're maybe used to it from other chemistry and physics courses where if you pick the right equation, you substitute the right values, and you get full grade. You're almost never going to see questions of that type in my exams and tests. But you will go through that in the tutorials and assignments. You will see examples of of um, how to work with the problems I've had. Numerical accuracy is obviously important, but takes a lower priority on my list, and then grammar and spelling is also important as well. So for assignments, you can work in groups of two, or by yourself. It's your choice. There's no requirement that you have to work in a group of two. And yet, if you choose to work in a group of two, the idea is that you learn from the person you're working with. Now, I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and the only requirement is that if you work with someone else, you, you still hand in a single submission. So there's no point in handing in two separate submissions that are identical. Hand in one submission with both names on it, but we don't, we're not going to accept a question one separate from question two. They're going to be stapled together and handed in simultaneously uh, for us to keep track. If there's 90 people in this class, uh, we can't we can't keep track of different people's material. One submission uh, that's handed in joint there. Late, uh, late days, so uh, there's a penalty for handing and stuff late, and that's because the TAs really need to get through the grading fairly quickly and get the material back to you. If you're delaying by handing in late, we're going to penalize that. But we recognize that some stuff happens in your life that uh, causes delay, so you get two late day credits. You can choose to apply two credits in one go to a single assignment, or you can apply one credit on one assignment and one credit on another assignment. So a single day here and a single day somewhere else. Or two days in one go. I will post the solutions though roughly within two days. Sometimes I may post the solutions earlier, in which case any assignments not handed in yet get zero grade. Once the solutions are up, no more assignments are being accepted. Okay, so that's the policy there on, on assignments. There's no makeup for them. Um, they count 15% of the course grade, and I will use all the assignments to estimate your uh, grade for the assignment portion. The dates, they're roughly due uh, every second week or so. Uh, they're all listed on the course website. Those dates are very in are fairly inflexible. So the reason for that is um, we've developed a new system this year based on a lot of feedback last term. Okay, I can't get this calendar going. But, um, Last, last term there was a big issue with uh, clashes between different courses where um, 3K, uh, sorry, 3P assignments were due at the same time as 4M assignments and students couldn't keep up with it. So I've set up a system and all the instructors have, have, have followed me along with it where we put all the, all the assignments due dates for all the courses on a single unified calendar. So all the instructors have coordinated their due dates so that they don't clash with each other. They're listed on that link over there. 
So you can go look at your course and all the other courses you're registered for and look at your due dates. As a result of that, we don't shift dates around. So once the dates are set, they're pretty much set because the moment we start shifting them around, we're going to cause clashes. Okay, so I'm going to be relatively inflexible about changing existing dates of our set up in the calendar. Um, obviously, if some major events come up, I will definitely consider moving things around, and I have done so in my previous um, On the group work, when, I, when we say that you can do assignments in a group, what we intend for you to do is the following. As an example, if two people are working on an assignment, both people do all questions in their own time. That's the intention. It's not that person one does question one and two and person B does the other question. It's that both people do all the questions in draft and then meet up in the library or if it's important or startups or whatever you prefer, um, virtually, online, through Google Docs. Uh, you can go through that assignment and exchange different ideas. So if you both agree, that's great. If you disagree, that's the interesting side, is when you both disagree with each other. Okay? Then you're figuring out what it is that the other person did differently to you and why they may be right or before you may be right. So you, you argue about it, you go through that, and you learn from each other. That's the key, the key here, is that you're learning from each other. And then, then you write up a joint solution, and then you can pick I'm uh, question one and two, and Brad can do question three, or whatever your preference is. But the idea is that initially, all the people have done the assignment on the graph. That's the intention. So it doesn't work if Sarah does question one and two, Brad does question three, they staple it together and hand it in. Brad hasn't learned anything in question one and two, and Sarah hasn't learned anything in question three. Okay, so that's not, not a useful way of doing the assignment. On the midterm, it is optional. If you don't show up, you don't show up, but there's no makeup for it. Um, it counts 20% of your grade. If you miss the midterm, that means your final counts 70%, which is a huge risk to <coughs> take. You're putting a tremendous amount of stress on yourself. I intentionally structure my courses so that there's a number of ways that I can judge your performance throughout the term rather than one single big final exam. That's an intentional decision from my side. If you choose not to write those midterms or that midterm, you're making the problem worse for yourself at the end. Okay? And as mentioned in the course outline, if you do not get a grade exceeding 50% in the final exam, you will fail this course no matter what your performance in any of the assignments and midterm. You must achieve 50% or grade in the final exam, not negotiable. If you do not know half the material in reactive design, the key chemical engineering course, you do not deserve to pass the chemical engineering at UK4. Okay, so, no budging on that requirement at all. So, final exam counts 50% of the grade, midterm counts 20%, and then there's a project that counts the remaining 15% of the assignments, counts the other one second. Project is due fairly early on in March, so it's not near the end in April where you've got all sorts of other projects due. I've shifted it to be a week or two before end of term. Um, again, that's group based. Groups of two. Uh, final exams. My final exams are always open book. You can bring in anything you like, the entire library, any notes, textbooks, whatever you prefer. Um, the only thing is, if I had my way, they could bring in iPads and computers and whatever, the university policy does not allow me to do that. Okay. Again, I said my courses are about understanding the concepts and the ideas and being able to apply them to new, new situations. That's not something that you can look up online or in your, in your notes. If you don't understand the material, no amount of textbook flipping and paper flipping is going to get you the answer. You have to understand the material. So that's why open notes, it's all cumulative. Everything we've learned up to the day before the midterm and up to the end of the course is in the final exam. Everything up to the day before the midterm is in the midterm. You may, yes? Um, what if you write the midterm and then end up doing better on the final? The, 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 you get the grade, you get the grade in the midterm, you get the grade in the final. Yeah, I don't do the, if you want it better than that, we want to. You write it, you write it. Um, 
You may submit electronically through Google Docs. Uh, this is a great way if you're working with another group member and they don't happen to live in the same city, you can collaborate remotely and work on your document together, submit an electronic document to the TA and myself to those two Gmail addresses, not that master addresses. So you go to Google Docs and you share the document with those two Gmail addresses. These details are on the course website. And I explain in detail how to share the document in Google Docs. We will grade it electronically. There's no paper involved. You're guaranteed to get your assignment back. You don't have to come to class to hand it. You don't have to come to class to pick it up. So we, uh, we, it's an option. I give you some students like Google Docs. Others absolutely hate it. Some people it just doesn't work out well for. But it's entirely your choice. Um, note though that we will treat a Google Doc submission any, the same way we treat a paper submission. You have, equations have to look like equations. Um, you have to use correct terminology and language. The fact that it's electronic doesn't excuse you from bad grammar, spelling, and bad equations and, and formatting of the documents. So, um, so that's one option to bear in mind. And then just, uh, just uh, some dates here for you to, to take note of. Well, they're on the calendar as well. The 13th of February is the midterm. It will be in the evening, starting at 5.30. Um, it will be an infinite time midterm. You can take as long as you like to write that thing. I will be there till 11 p.m. and then I'll probably go on. And then I expect to cover it as well. So it's going to normally be a two hour exam, two and a half hour exam, but you can take five, six hours to write that thing if you like. Uh, infinite time midterm. There's the project here on the 27th of March. The last class is 8th of April. Just a second. And then uh, the final exam is <laughs> So um, what I'd like you to do is take a look at the calendar on the course website. There is something to do. Just a second, everyone. So we'll just wrap up here. Just a minute. Uh, so every there's something to do on the calendar every second week. So there's either an assignment or a midterm or a project here. Every second week. Every second week. So just take a look at those, those dates. Are there any questions after I wrap up from this very long class?